It's kind of hard to talk about imaging using an audio podcast, but we've talked about EEG patterns and EMG abnormalities, so I guess we can do our best with a discussion on some MRI findings. As I'm sure you're aware, in stroke, we rely on the DWI sequence, diffusion-weighted imaging, and the ADC correlate, apparent diffusion coefficient, which is helpful to identify regions of cerebral infarction. But some bright DWI signals don't always mean stroke. In today's episode of Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine, and all the fascinating science and history that come with it, we will cover some basic principles of diffusion-weighted MRI, some artifacts, and what else you should think about besides stroke when you see abnormalities on diffusion. Stay with us. I thought this was a bit interesting. The fundamental principle that underlies diffusion-weighted imaging is that it measures the Brownian motion of particles in space, or more specifically, the random movement of water molecules. When there's impairment of this random motion of water molecules, we call it restricted diffusion, and this is what appears bright on the DWI sequence and dark on the ADC. And when you see this, you should think about three things, really. Cytotoxic edema, high cellularity, or slowed flow of extracellular water. And I'll say that again because this is such a key concept. Restricted diffusion indicates the presence of cytotoxic edema, high cellularity, or slow flow of water. And when I say cytotoxic edema, I'm distinguishing this from terms like cytotoxic injury and cell death because not uncommonly we will see patterns of restricted diffusion reverse in stroke with recanalization and in seizures with anti-epileptic treatment and so on. The bright signal on DWI and the dark signal on ADC dissipate and there is no subsequent lesion on the T2 or the flare. But when I say bright on DWI and dark on ADC, these are relative terms. Bright in relation to what? Each tissue has different degrees of diffusivity, right? In the lateral ventricles, for example, the CSF, the random motion of water molecules is totally unencumbered, unrestricted. So ventricular spaces appear darker relative to the tissue around it. In regions with more encumbered movement of water, For example, when ATP stores are depleted by a lack of glucose supply and therefore the ATP-dependent sodium-potassium channels are impaired, this leads to sodium and chloride accumulation within the neurons and subsequent osmotic shifts, which draw water molecules into these cells, limiting the diffusivity of water around the cells. And this impaired movement of water around the cells is what we mean by restricted diffusion. As neurons draw in this extracellular water, It prohibits the normal Brownian motion and diffusion of water around these cells. So that was restricted diffusion that we attribute to cytotoxic edema. In situations where there's high cellularity, as in the case of certain tumors like lymphoma and meningiomas, we can also see restricted diffusion due to a separate mechanism. These cells are just packed too close for there to be normal movement of extracellular water. And lastly, slow flow of extracellular water due to a disturbance of that space. Here I'm talking about a high viscosity state. Intracranial abscess is probably the best example here. These brain lesions amass large amounts of very purulent material and cellular debris, which limits the motion of water molecules and therefore appears very bright on the DWI sequence. And in fact, abscess has produced some of the strongest diffusion signals of all intracranial lesions. So keep these concepts in mind as we navigate through the various causes of neurologic injury that manifest radiographically on the DWI and ADC sequences. I've organized this talk kind of anatomically, starting with cortical DWI changes and then migrating through the basal ganglia, deep gray structure abnormalities, and then lastly, abnormalities on DWI that affect predominantly the white matter. So beginning with lesions that can affect the cerebral cortex and the juxtacortical spaces, Obviously, we have to think about cerebral ischemia, and this can be arterial or venous ischemia, so don't forget that. When I see a pattern of cortical and juxtacortical restricted diffusion that does not respect a vascular territory, or if there's associated T2 prolongation or T2 brightness that's out of proportion to the DWI changes, then I'm definitely thinking of a venous infarction, among a couple of other things. And with venous ischemia, you might also find petechial or confluent hemorrhages around these same areas. Besides vascular etiologies and moving on to other reasons for cortical restricted diffusion, seizure is probably the next most likely condition you'll see in an adult. With longer seizure activity, even if it's subclinical or it's non-convulsive, you'll begin to see signs of cortical neuronal injury in the form of cytotoxic edema. You'll almost never see subcortical involvement in these situations, and the restricted diffusion pattern can be holohemispheric, it can be unilateral, or it can be patchy. So, seizure. Seizure. 
In a similar scenario, an unresponsive or an altered patient, hypoglycemic or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can also cause predominant cortically restricted diffusion patterns, especially in the high frontal and the occipital regions. Such metabolic distress will often lead to injury of other highly metabolically active tissues like the thalamus and the basal ganglia, sometimes even the cerebellum, so you should see diffusion restriction in these areas as well. Important to note is that Unlike an acute ischemic stroke, it may take more than a few hours or even a day or two before you begin to see these DWI changes in the cortex and deep gray nuclei when your patients experienced HIE or severe hypoglycemia. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease would also be on my short differential for a patchy, cortically predominant restricted diffusion in an appropriate clinical context. And a lot like what you might see in seizure or HIE or encephalitis or even MELOS, CJD can affect one or many regions of the brain. Again, not confined to a singular vascular territory, and often not involving the subcortical white matter. Other specific regions of the brain that can restrict temporal lobes, I think about HSV encephalitis, HHV6 encephalitis, seizures again, or especially if it's restricted to the mesial temporal lobes, I'd be concerned for an autoimmune limbic encephalitis, like NMDA, LGI1, or encephalitis associated with AMPA antibodies. And then there are some nonspecific viruses that can cause restricted diffusion of the cortex, influenza, measles, and many others. In an unrelated mechanism of cytotoxic edema, in the case of tumors, where you have neuronal injury or high cell density and a disrupted extracellular matrix, there can be restricted diffusion. And sitting on top of the cortex, you might see a well-circumscribed bright lesion on DWI, which is most commonly going to be a meningioma in adults. Meningiomas and intracranial lymphomas have a very similar radiographic appearance on MRI, both typically well circumscribed, bright on DWI due to that high cellularity, and they also exhibit homogeneous enhancement. Like a meningioma, a meningeal hemangiopericytoma may also have a meningeal tail. In children, the bright WI tumors include the PNET or the primitive neuroectodermal tumor, which is a rare cerebral tumor that often has cystic features and necrosis. Histologically related to the PNET is the medulloblastoma, which also has bright foci on DWI and stark on ADC, and it frequently originates in cerebellar vermis, and as I'm sure you remember, the medulloblastoma is the most common malignant tumor of childhood. Returning to adult medicine, press is an atypical condition where you might see cortical or juxtacortical restricted diffusion, and I bring it up because we just saw a case of this the other day, and it was surprising to me how much restricted diffusion we saw on the MRI. But according to one retrospective cohort of 66 patients with PRESS from 2007, 17% of patients with PRESS had evidence of restricted diffusion. And often, the DWI changes will correlate with the severity of the PRESS. This could easily be confused with subacute ischemia of the affected regions. So always keep an open mind when you see patterns of restricted diffusion and T2 prolongation with edema, especially when they're not confined to a single vascular territory. A good rule of thumb here is because atypical press can mimic conditions like HIE and hypoglycemic encephalopathy is that unlike the DWI changes of HIE or hypoglycemia, the DWI patterns in press tend to be less extensive than the T2 changes, whereas the T2 changes tend to be more prominent in press, and the DWI changes are often less impressive, kind of like what we see with venous sinus thrombosis. Next, let's consider the causes of restricted diffusion in the deep gray structures, the basal ganglia and the thalami. Restricted diffusion in these regions has a very interesting differential, and unlike causes of cortical diffusion changes, stroke ends up being one of the less common causes of cytotoxic edema in these regions. If it is a stroke, however, an infarction of the artery of percheron at the tip of the basilar or a straight sinus thrombosis could be reasons for biothalamic diffusion changes. Worth mentioning here is that The thalamus and the basal ganglia are highly metabolically active, as I've already mentioned. They are rich in mitochondria. So any toxin or nutritional state that could impair mitochondrial function can cause restricted diffusion in these regions. And let's think about that for a minute. Among toxic exposures, carbon monoxide is on the short list, as it inhibits electron transport in the mitochondria. Carbon monoxide poisoning is also known to cause necrosis of the globus pallidi with hypodensity on head CT and T1 shortening on MRI, or T1 darkness, sometimes with a delayed leukoencephalopathy after a few weeks. Methanol is another mitochondrial poison, and in addition to the basal ganglia dysfunction, methanol selectively affects white matter tracts, leading to blindness as a manifestation of optic neuritis, 
and severe confusion as a result of the diffuse cerebral white matter damage in severe cases. These patients should also have a severe anion gap acidosis and GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Cyanide is a rare toxin, but it also affects the electron transport chain with basal ganglia restricted diffusion. More commonly, what you might see is an acute hyperaminemic encephalopathy, which can cause T2 prolongation and DWI changes to the basal ganglia, often with involvement of the insula and the parafalcine cortex. And sometimes in these patients, you might also see global cerebral edema. Mitochondrial disease is another consideration, kind of getting back to the metabolic demand of these tissues. In particular, Lay's necrotizing encephalomyelopathy causes putaminal and basal ganglionic diffusion and T2 changes. Fun fact about Lay's is that, while it is a mitochondrial disease, three quarters of all cases are due to nuclear mutations, not mutations to the mitochondrial DNA, which we inherit from our mothers. So you don't need a strong maternal history here. Lay's can fit an autosomal dominant or recessive pattern from any side of the family. The last metabolic cause of deep gray structure restricted diffusion is one that you never want to miss in the emergency room, and one that our ER docs are really good at empirically treating, Wernicke's encephalopathy. Hopefully, you'll already have started thiamine and folate repletion before you've gotten the MRI in suspected cases of Wernicke's, treating the patient based on the presence of either confusion or ataxia or ophthalmoplegia with or without nystagmus, this horrible triad that students are expected to commit to memory despite the fact that fewer than a third of all patients meet all three criteria. Radiographically, in Wernicke's, the medial thalami, the mammillary bodies, tegmentum, periaqueductal region, and tectal plate are common sites of restricted diffusion, although you might also see DWI or T2 changes in the dorsal medulla, the red nuclei, cerebellum, and corpus callosum, which we tend to see more commonly in our non-alcoholic patients who have acute thiamine deficiency. And speaking of alcoholism, osmotic demyelination is also worth mentioning, because it can cause restricted diffusion of the deep gray structures and the cerebellar and cerebral white matter. Classically, you see pontine changes on DWI, which evolve over 24 hours after the onset of appendicular and extraocular muscle weakness, and it's rarely associated with enhancement, as you might see in inflammatory causes of demyelination or subacute infarction. And we'll get to the white matter tracks in a minute. The two remaining categories of deep gray diffusion restriction are infectious and neoplastic processes. A viral encephalitis would not be unusual in the context of fever and rapidly progressive cognitive impairment, but when you see diffusion changes on the MRI, that really should hone in your diagnosis. In children, EBV encephalitis should absolutely be considered although it can also cause a radiculoneuritis and flu-like symptoms. And these days, I regret to say, measles is also a concern. It can cause cortical and basal ganglia diffusion changes with significant edema when there's an encephalitis that's attributed to measles. The mosquito-borne pathogen West Nile virus also has a predilection for the basal ganglia, and this virus can also cause an anterior horn myelitis or a radiculoneuritis. Japanese encephalitis would be on the longer list of the rare causes for bilateral thalamic disease, but it's a very specific pattern that you see in these patients. It infrequently restricts, and there's often T2 prolongation and edema of these thalami, kind of appearing like a subacute artery of Percheron infarction or straight sinus thrombosis. The rabies virus, although we don't see that as much these days, should make that short list of infectious causes of basal ganglia restricted diffusion, and we actually saw a case of that in Philadelphia just a year ago. The last infectious process that I think about would be the variant form of CJD, which is the form that you get from contaminated meat products, causing that classic hockey stick or pulvinar sign of the bilateral thalami. So, some interesting infections to keep in mind. Regarding neoplasia, a midline pineoblastoma would also show DWI brightness, and it's a highly cellular, highly malignant tumor that often has necrotic features, which is why it's so bright on diffusion. And clinically, these patients who have pineoblastomas present with symptoms of obstructive hydrocephalus with severe headache and nausea, vomiting, impaired upgaze, altered consciousness. And the differential diagnosis of a pineoblastoma would be your germinoma, which is the most common tumor of the pineal gland, and it affects predominantly young males when the tumor originates here. They have a peak incidence of about 10 to 12 years of age with almost all patients presenting before their 20s. Metastases and primary tumors of the CNS, like a glioblastoma, these less commonly affect the deep gray structures, but I would keep an open mind in your older patients. Moving on to the white matter disease. So lesions of the white matter that demonstrate restricted diffusion also have a very broad differential. It'd be best to think of these lesions in terms of their size, their number, location, as in are they periventricular or juxtacortical, 
and what other associated changes on the remaining MRI sequences we see, like significant vasogenic edema on T2, how intense the diffusion abnormality is, and whether there's any associated contrast enhancement. The really bright DWI signal changes are seen in acute ischemia, as well as abscesses, as I mentioned earlier in the program. And abscesses are often found just beneath the cortex, and they may or may not be ring-like or ring-enhancing with significant surrounding edema. Some tumors, like epidermoid cysts, can be patchy and they can look irregular, but at some places very bright. And variable patterns of brightness can be seen in all other conditions. And just like before, it's useful to group these conditions so that you aren't missing something. Ischemic changes, although I've mentioned this before, should always be considered in your differential for restricted diffusion, so make sure that your lesion or lesions fit a vascular pattern, or maybe they're multifocal juxtacortical lesions, as in an embolic shower or endocarditis, Typically, you should also see cortical lesions in this situation, or maybe the lesions are purely subcortical, perhaps confined to the internal border zone between the ACA and MCA, or MCA, ACA, and PCA, as you might see with a proximal anterior stenosis. Atypical vascular causes could cause press, as I've mentioned before, and then there's RCVS. But again, all that restricts does not infarct, right? So what else do we consider? After vascular causes, when thinking about white matter disease, I think about inflammatory causes. Could the purely white matter diffusion lesion reflect an inflammatory cause of demyelination, such as MS, sarcoidosis, Bichette's? Absolutely. So look for other radiographic features of MS, like infratentorial or spinal lesions. Check the CSF for oligoclonal bands, or check a serum-soluble IL-2 receptor for sarcoidosis. Neoplasma is another cause to think about, and this could be primary or secondary. But if it's primary, is it a glioblastoma or a high-grade glioma, which typically shows necrotic features or hemorrhage or peripheral enhancement and crosses the corpus callosum? Could it be a primary CNS lymphoma, which often has homogeneous enhancement, as I mentioned earlier, or sometimes ring enhancement? Other tumors we've already mentioned, but again, it's the high cellularity of some of these tumors that leads to a pattern of restricted diffusion. Thinking about infections, you should think about PML in your immunocompromised patients, because it almost always restricts, and the diffusion signal persists over repeat MRIs, unlike acute demyelination or stroke. Unfortunately, when you're just looking at one scan, the DWI may not help you differentiate PML from other inflammatory lesions. Besides the JC virus, there are a lot of other viruses that can involve the white matter. But more selectively, Powassan encephalitis involves various white matter regions, which includes the pons, cerebellum, and the supratentorial white matter. Because it's a little bit more unusual, I'll say that Powassan virus is an arbovirus that's transmitted by deer ticks, and it can co-infect patients with Borrelia species, causing Lyme disease as well. Nipovirus is another virus that affects the deep white matter in about half of patients, less commonly affecting the temporal lobe, the pons, the cerebral peduncles, but Nipovirus tends not to enhance. Bacterial and fungal abscesses, like I mentioned before, can cause restricted diffusion in the white matter and in the juxtacortical regions. Then we have the various leukodystrophies that can be associated with diffusion abnormalities, but one with a very specific pattern is catacil, cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy, which is associated with the NOTCH3 mutation. Catacil has a very particular penchant for affecting the anterior temporal white matter and the external capsule on T2, but diffusion changes can be seen almost anywhere in the subcortical white matter. And I've already mentioned osmotic demyelination, but one other toxicity of the white matter to note would be heroin inhalation leukoencephalopathy, chasing the dragon. We discussed this syndrome at length back in episode 132, so check that out. Safe to say that the imaging findings here can be delayed by days or weeks, and they often show a very high DWI signal, but not always associated with ADC darkness. I think that about covers most of the conditions you should think about when there is true restricted diffusion on brain MRI. Keep in mind though that restricted diffusion is the result of impaired extracellular movement of water, which can be due to cytotoxic edema, as in stroke, high cellularity, as in some tumors like meningiomas, lymphomas, and PNET, or it's due to a highly viscous extracellular space, as in abscesses. And before we wrap up, let's at least acknowledge two major artifacts of the DWI, things that we see very commonly that appear relatively bright on DWI but do not indicate restricted diffusion. In the cortex, especially with the anterior temporal lobes and the parafalcine orbitofrontal cortex, you'll often see very bright cortical DWI signal, which is due to a bony artifact, a disruption of the normal signal that we see, and this can really confound your interpretation of cortical diffusion abnormalities. 
Then there's also T2 shine through in which we see T2 prolongation or T2 hyper intensity that leads to hyper intense DWI signal changes. And the way that you confirm this is more of an artifact is looking at the co-registered ADC map, which will reveal a corresponding ISO intense or hyper intense region of interest, as opposed to a dark region, which should otherwise indicate restricted diffusion. I really hope this episode was helpful and not too dry. I could have talked about how B1000 images are generated from the B0 images, which are basically your T2 sequences, and how the ADC map is calculated, but really it's just important to know that the ADC map is generated so that we can eliminate the confounding effect of T2 signal changes, that T2 shine through I talked about. For some interesting images, I would recommend that you take a look at the post from this week on the Brainwave's Twitter feed, which shows the various DWI patterns and some other cool images that we've referenced in our show today, and a great paper that was published in Neurology Clinical Practice years ago. This week's episode of the Brainwaves podcast was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with music courtesy of Uncanny and Kevin McLeod, sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. For more information about what was discussed on the show, as always, you can take a look at our show notes for the references to the highest yield literature on the topics, and follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon. Brainwaves.